The world is becoming more diverse. The question is, are we the people of God becoming more united? I'm Alex Diaz. Welcome to Mosaics Today with Rachel and Mark. On each episode of this podcast, you'll discover unique insights, hear from credible practitioners, and learn promising practices to help you build a healthy, multi-ethnic, culturally intelligent, socially just, and financially sustainable church. The kingdom of God is not segregated. Why on earth is the church? And now, here's your host, Rachel and Mark. Welcome to our latest episode of Mosaics Today with Rachel and Mark. I'm Rachel Gilmore, here with Mark DeMaz from Mosaics, just sharing some thoughts, these basic foundational principles with you. Season one is just kind of kind of an introduction to get to know some of the methodologies, the theology, the principles that undergird everything that we'll be sharing with you. So thank you to everybody who's joined in. We've had a really great response and feedback to the podcast so far. We're so grateful that you're with us on this journey. And while we've been spending a lot of our initial episodes talking a lot about what multi-ethnic church planting is, uh, we want to introduce kind of a new principle to you today, right? Um, And it kind of stems from a book, Mark, that you wrote with Thomas. Nelson in 2017 called Disruption, and it touches on like church economics and, and what is disruption in the business world, in the church world. Tell us more about it. The title of the book was Disruption, Repurposing the Church to Redeem the Community. You know, how many of you that are listening, or Rachel, I'm sure you've experienced it, you go to a conference, or you get around to other pastors, or you maybe go to a church, and somebody, the pastor stands up and says, we're going to take this city for Christ. You know, we're going to change this city for Christ. And everybody applauds and everybody's all excited. I often ask that of a room full of pastors, you know, at a conference. I say, how many of you ever heard or said that? And they all raise their hand. And then I follow it up with a question. I'm like, how many of you have ever seen it happen? And you know what? Everybody laughed. It's a standard response. Everybody has heard that line or said it themselves, but nobody has ever seen it happen, so to speak. They laugh because what they understand intrinsically is it's rhetoric without results. Like no church is going to take the city for Christ. Let's just be honest about that. Your church, my church, nobody's going to take the city for Christ. But you might be able to take an apartment complex. You might be able to take a a trailer park, a zip code, right? And so narrowing down to understand what is your parish, so to speak, and aggregating resources and attention into that to create synergistic uplift. And that's how you get beyond rhetoric to results for the glory of God. Now, as I thought about that, uh, I came across an article in 2016, right before I was speaking at a national conference, the Evangelical Covenant Church. I got to tell you, I was in my hotel room scared to death, right? I was like, what in the world am I going to say? I got great friends, Brenda Salter McNeil, Sung Cha Ra, Ephraim Smith. They've spoken for these national events. And I'm like, what do I got to say to this otherwise amazing denomination? And I came across an article talking about the concept of disruption. What is disruption in the business world? It was mined in 1996 at Harvard by the late Clayton Christensen. And it's a business principle, again, known as disruption. And what they did at Harvard in the late 90s is they set out to discover why is it that organizations or companies, or in our case, it would be churches, why is it that they get to the top of their S-curve, so to speak? They go from ground zero, all of a sudden, they're the brand name, they're, they're cranking on all cylinders, everything's great about this company, and then it stagnates and goes into decline. So to make a long story short, beyond the other reasons that they had as hypotheses for why this might happen, they were shocked by the answer. And the number one reason a company or an organization gets to a level, a high plateau, and then stagnates, ultimately goes into decline, is because they pay attention to their current customers. That is the worst thing you can do is pitch the company, or again, in our case, pitch the church to people who are already there and like it the way that you're doing things. You have to be thinking about who's not at the table, who's not a part of our church, who's not a part, who hasn't bought into our brand, so to speak, if it was a business. And that's who you're thinking about. It's who's next, not who is. And as I thought about that, I said, oh my gosh, that is so true of the church. Most pastors in America, and this is prior to COVID, in my opinion, they were simply managing decline. Churches had already peaked, they're stagnant, they're going into decline. And and a lot of the reason when you understand the concept of disruption is because pastors are timid or they're afraid or they're listening to their current strong voices in their church. You see what I'm saying? And the voices that are already there, then that a pastor starts listening to those voices and then gets afraid to push it through. And then we don't. And that's how you stagnate and go into decline. That's the basic concept of disruption. And I love that you're sharing this because it so often happens with church planters, right? Like you start 
a faith community. It's growing. You're reaching new people. There's excitement. But then you're three, four, five, as you start to get self-sustaining and relax, you turn inward and and you start focusing on just maintenance instead of mission, instead of reaching new folks. Um, I found that a lot when I was planting a church and my worship leader, Andy Gilstrap, would always reference William Temple's quote, who said, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of those who are not yet members. And so that reminder that we are here not for our current customers, you know, or members, folks who are already feeling the transformation of their lives because of what Christ is doing here, but we exist for those outside of the church who don't yet know this. And so we would kind of embed that in the DNA through preaching, through teaching. Every time that we prayed as an admin council, we would hold hands in a circle, but face outward and say, who's out there that needs to be in here? So you're right. We struggle with that in the business world, perhaps, but especially in the church. And I I think it's why a lot of churches haven't just plateaued, but are declining and are experiencing more declining COVID because they don't have this connection anymore. They don't even know what people want outside of the church because they're just so insulated and it's become this country club mentality. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, you know, let's take this city for Christ. Um, I've really been interested in this post-colonial move of church planting. What does it mean to say, we're not taking anything for Christ. Let's open up our eyes and see where Christ is at work, how Christ is loving and serving the community and how we can come alongside to help people realize that this is the triune God in their midst. So I'm so grateful you're talking about this. This is huge. So, you know, tell me more about disruption now that we know that this happens in the church. What's our response? What do we do about this? How do we keep it from happening? What we're talking about then is a structural shift within the mentality as we approach uh, planting, growing, and developing local churches. So the best way to describe it, Rachel, is to think about an American football team. A football team is made up actually of three teams, offense, defense, and special teams right? We don't typically talk about it, but those are three separate teams playing three separate games all under the banner of one team. For instance, offense is a very different game than defense, and defense is a very different game than offense. And those games are so different that the players who play those games never play on the field at the same time. So they're on the macro field, but they're not playing at the same time. That's how different the games are, right? The games are so different. Each team has its own head coach, We call them coordinators, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, the special teams coordinator. The games and the teams are so different, they have their own set of metrics, right? For instance, you would never ask the defense when it comes off the field, how many points did you score, right? They'd go, wait a second, that's not our job. Yeah, every now and then it's like 6 or we recover a fumble and, you know, but that's not our job. Our job is not to score points. Our job is to keep the other team from scoring points, right? So different games, different teams, different players, different playbooks, different coaches, different metrics, three separate teams on the one team. Now, to win a big game like the Super Bowl, let's say, all three of those teams have to be functioning at a very high level and minimizing mistakes throughout that that 60-minute period or you don't win the game. For instance, you could have a strong offense, but if your defense can't stop the run, you don't win. You could have a great offense and defensive performance, but in the last three seconds of the game, if the snap goes bad, the kicker's kick is blocked, or it hits the upright, special teams has failed, and therefore your team loses. So think about this analogy then related to a church. The words I want to interchange here, instead of offense, defense, special teams, think about spiritual, social, and financial. Spiritual, social, and financial. Every church has a spiritual team right? Evangelism, discipleship, children's ministry, worship, visiting people in the hospital, small groups, whatever. Think about that as a spiritual playbook. Just like the offensive team has a playbook, we have a playbook for seeing people saved, discipled, replicate the faith, and multiply. Let's put that under the spiritual team, if you will. But again, that's mostly what people have. You need a three-dimensional game today in the 21st century But most churches are still playing a one-dimensional game and they're not effective. You're not winning because no team in football can win if all you have is an offense. So if all you have is a spiritual game today, you're on a one-legged stool, you can't win. You need to establish two other teams under the one team. And the second team is the social team. That's where you develop a nonprofit alongside your nonprofit. So the church is a nonprofit, but you develop a nonprofit, a second entity that's like two sisters in the same house. 
and you move your justice, compassion, and mercy work out from under the budget of a church into the budget of a new nonprofit. You don't create 10 nonprofits. You create one nonprofit, let's say, with 10 programs. If you create 10 nonprofits, you got 10 tax returns. You have 10 offices. You have 10 copiers, 10 receptionists, right? It's not a workable model, but you create one nonprofit. And under that, you can scale and create as many programs as you want. By setting up that second leg, so we call that just quickly the social leg, like your defense, if you will, that's your justice, compassion, and mercy work, and you can scale it there under the nonprofit in ways you can't under the church. I'll mention more about that in a second. The third leg, then, is your financial leg. I'm not talking about tithes and offerings here. I'm talking about leveraging church assets to bless the community and, at the same time, generate some measure of profitable income, for-profit business enterprise that advances your mission but keeps you sustainable. So the disruptive model of the 21st century that churches need to pitch forward to is moving away from a one-dimensional game to developing a three-dimensional game, the spiritual game, your healthy, multi-ethnic, economically diverse church, advancing the spiritual ball, if you will, the nonprofit, your social leg that's doing your justice, compassion, mercy work, and thirdly, developing for-profit business enterprise by leveraging your assets, helping to create jobs, uh, bring a reduction of crime into your community, repurpose abandoned property, uh, generate tax revenue for a city. These are the good works of Matthew 5.16 that a lost and dying world is going to pay attention to. They're not going to pay attention to us explaining the gospel in the 21st century. We're going to have to demonstrate the power of redemption in not only in people's lives, but in communities, economics, buildings, all of that. And that is the work of the third leg, your special team, so to speak. So that's the disruptive model. And I would suggest that's what every church needs to get to and get away from a one-dimensional game and play a three-dimensional game in the 21st century uh, in order to be credible and relevant for the sake of the gospel. I love that. And and for people listening who are like, okay, that sounds great, but what does that really look like? Can you tell me a little bit about how this was implemented in your church at Mosaics and, and about the nonprofit you started and the kinds of ministries or businesses that you're engaged in now? How has this worked for you specifically? Think about it again, like a football team. So your, your macro team, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Dallas Cowboys, that's the macro team, right? This first leg then is going to be your spiritual game plan. That spiritual leg, the church, the healthy, multi-ethnic, economically diverse church, which, by the way, is the disruptive shift for most churches right now as well, moving away from homogeneity to becoming healthy, multi-ethnic, and economically diverse on the first leg. Who's the coach of that team? That's the senior pastor or the lead pastor, right? And how does that team generate income? That team generates income through tithes and offerings. What we're talking about then is that lead pastor on the spiritual side. The second leg of the stool is your nonprofit. That's going to be led by an executive director, an MSW type, right? And you empower that person to do it. Why do you move your justice, compassion, and mercy out from under the church uh, budget into the budget of nonprofit because on the economic side, that's how you can get local, state, and federal grants. That's why other churches will write you checks for the works that you do and or send you people to work in the ministry, right? Churches don't write checks to other churches. That just typically doesn't happen. And your church isn't typically going to send people to help me do something under my church, but they'll send it to your nonprofit. They'll send the money, they'll send the people to help do that social justice and compassionate work, mercy work under the nonprofit uh, that you create. So what does that look like? In our setting, we have the largest food distribution in Little Rock, right? Uh, 67% of the zip code, for instance, depends on us for three to four days of fresh groceries every month. Uh, we have an immigration counseling center that goes back to 2005 that serviced more than 10,000 people in that time to help them get their legal status correct. Uh, we have a uh, obviously closed distribution. We have an award-winning uh, chess program for at-risk kids. Uh, by the way, just took second place the other day in a worldwide tournament on the Internet. So these are kids out of the inner city playing chess and killing it. All of that is done under the auspices of the nonprofit, Vine and Village. And again, led by an executive director, generating income for support through grants and donations. I'm going to jump in really quickly here, Mark, interrupt, because I think it's crucial what you just shared. This is something pastors might not realize, is they should not, as in football, they are not the ones leading all of these teams. Theirs is the spiritual leg, and then you need to find someone, as you mentioned, with an MSW, some type of executive, to run this nonprofit. That's a really important point, and I get that question all the time. You, you just made a very important point. 
You don't have to run everything. Think of yourself as maybe the general manager of the team and the head coach of the offense, if you will, the spiritual team. It's not uncommon in, in football for uh, somebody to be the head coach and also the defensive coordinator, right? So you can be the head coach and pick up one of these legs, but you don't have to do it everything and you shouldn't do everything. And then the third leg is going to be led by a CEO type or business people or a team, because the last thing you want to be doing as a pastor is leading the business side. In fact, when pastors Amen. use the word ministry, yeah, when pastors use the word ministry in the context of money, it typically means a financial loss. So we need to empower people who understand business. We're not cutthroat in this. We're not trying to make top dollar, but you can't keep giving everything away for free. If you keep giving everything away for free in terms of your ministry to the community, you're not going to be here in five years. So that third leg is the business side, the financial side is is led by CEO types, business people, and they leverage the assets of the church to generate for profitable income. So it's not tithes and offerings, not grants and donations, but it's actual for profit. It could be in the form of rent. So in our church, we rent our facility. I got a 50,000 square foot uh, fitness club, health club in a building. They pay us rent. I got an event center. We're putting in a 5,500 square foot grocery store later on this year. All of those things leverage our building to generate income. I'm working with a church in Columbia, Missouri right now. Same exact thing. We're about to rent space. I got involved with them. I said, they're, they were spending, check this out, $26,000 a month is going out their door in the term of mortgage and rents. I'm like, we need to make that money. You've got this huge footprint here. And so instantly, all of a sudden, we're renting space for $2,500. we are going to get out of a $5,000 a month lease that's just sitting there. And, and on and on I could go. So you're leveraging assets to generate income. And that means you have more money in terms of ties and offerings to spend on direct ministry versus going to a bank and paying for bricks and mortar. So that's the three-legged stool, senior pastor, executive pastor, CEO type, Ties and offerings, grants and donations, for-profit business income. You put it all together, it advances Matthew 5, 16. They see the good works of the, of the church, bringing diverse people together, doing social justice and compassionate mercy work in the community, uh, repurposing abandoned property, creating jobs, helping to lower crime. You get all that working on those three legs. And that, again, is what helps us win, if you will, in the 21st century in terms of credibility and relevance to an increasingly diverse, painfully polarized and cynical society. Awesome. I love everything that you shared and it's bringing up like 8,000 questions in my mind. So I know that this is going to have to be another podcast, which means that this will be our next podcast. I hope everybody who's listened today has learned something and is as curious as I am to know more, to talk more, to have more Q&A time, um, because that's what Mark and I are ready and prepared to do, to really unpack more of this third leg um, on church economics in our next episode of Mosaics Today. So thank you again for joining us. If you have any any questions at all about anything Mark or I have discussed, please go to the Mosaics website for more information or reach out and contact us directly or post and subscribe to this podcast, comment below, and we'll check in on you there. But thanks again for joining us for this latest episode of Mosaics Today. You've been listening to Mosaics Today with Rachel and Mark. Take a moment to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to this podcast. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and why, visit mosaicstoday.info. That's mosaicstoday.info. I'm Alex Diaz. We'll see you next time on Mosaics Today.